Good evening, everyone. Good to be with you on this third week in our Advent Bible study. Um, for those of you who were uh, here last week, you might recall I forgot to record our session, but I just hit record, so we're good on that this time. But if you look at the Senate website, um, you'll find I kind of went back and did a reprise of that session and, and, and did a recording of that, so there is something available there now. Uh, but we are recording now, and that will be posted a link to this will be posted uh, for, for later viewing if you'd like to share that. Uh, so quick recap of where we've been two weeks thus far, uh, looking at uh, what child is this, how the Old Testament prepares us to receive God's Messiah. Uh, our first week was largely looking at the deep roots of the idea of Messiah uh, in the Old Testament and tracing that all the way back into the very creation uh, narrative of Genesis that we in God's image are created to have dominion over creation uh, and to do that in a stewarding way, very much in partnership uh, in cooperation with God and how that kind of feeds into uh, what one who is to be in a particularly special role of dominion, i.e. as a king or a Messiah, an anointed one, all ways of saying the same thing, uh, with and for God, uh, even uh, even so intimately such that Psalm 2 calls this 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 uh, uh, king partner with God on par with God's own son. Uh, so it kind of set the stage for that in week one and looked at how ancient Israel wanted to have a king uh, like the nations round about them and reluctantly God allowed that. Uh, we looked at some of the history and a few of the, the, the kings, such as David, Solomon, and uh, just noted how it was basically a failure. Uh, no king came close to living up to um, uh, the expectations of one who would be God's son, one, would be, one who would be a god, uh, I'm sorry, would be a king co-ruling with God. Uh, David, Solomon, nobody came close to that. In fact, they were, for the most part, all colossal failures. And the result of that we largely saw in the history of ancient Israel, the collapse of the monarchy uh, after Solomon, the split between north and south, and then subsequently the fall of those two kingdoms to foreign powers, which um, the prophets largely attribute to the failed and misguided leadership of the kings uh, by and large. Um, and we kind of left it there with week one. So Messiahship failed. Where do we go from here? Where does God go from here? And uh, where we went then last week was to the Psalms and took kind of a, a broad scale, holistic look at the book of Psalms um, and noted how there really is a remarkable progression uh, that largely parallels ancient Israel's history that we see with the Psalms, that opens, for example, with Psalms 1 and 2, you might say very hopeful, very optimistic in terms of Psalm 1, lifting up God's commandments, Torah, God's law, and the ordering uh, gift that it is. And then in Psalm 2, uh, the lifting up of one who would be God's Messiah, the idea, that the very idea that that could happen, but that it must happen in tandem with what Psalm 1 presented, the, that this, this one is to rule um, by the guidelines of God's law, not our law. Psalm 3 then gave a, uh, a preview of what we already knew would happen historically. Uh, Psalm 3 is a lament uh, that is attributed to David as he mourns, as he grieves the tragic loss of his son, Absalom, uh, who actually died in an effort to overthrow his father, David. Um, so in, uh, in, a, in a little nutshell, in Psalms 1, 2, and 3, we saw expectations and failure of expectations. And the rest of the book of Psalms is really, uh, really is a witness in many ways to the, the large, the long scale working out of that. But also then, and, and, and by the way, as we said last week, Psalm 89 really is, this, the ending of Psalm 89 uh, really is the punchline of the failure of uh, Messiahship. These are the all the kings of Israel. 
But then the last, those last two, quote, books of the book of Psalms see something that is possibly possible beyond that. The fourth major section of the book of Psalms, book four, as it's referred to, we noted last week, lifts up the idea of God as cosmic, universal king of all that is, of all creation, as a way of reassuring uh, those with ears to hear that even though the earthly kingship had failed, the divine one had not, that was still firm and in place. And then because of that, the later Psalms begin to show a, a remarkable um, presence of hope for a second go, if you will, and having an earthly king that might just be able one day somehow to live up to the moniker of God's son, as Psalm 2 noted. Uh, to the guidelines of kingship, as Psalm 72 noted. And as a result of that, that hope that is based in, that is based solely in a profound sense of God's faithfulness to covenant promises to us, God's, God's steadfast love to us, regardless of our uh, failure to keep covenant and to live up to the, uh, the guidelines that God sets out for us, that in response to that, we saw the book of Psalms ending on a resounding note of hallelujah, of praise to the Lord. Uh, the last uh, uh, seven or eight Psalms of the book, and then uh, the, the chorus of all choruses, Psalm 150, which is hallelujah after hallelujah after hallelujah. Um, very profound, dramatic uh, 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 ending of hope with the book of Psalms. That kind of harkens you back to, well, maybe Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 are not lost causes. Uh, maybe the embodiment of God's Torah among us is still possible. Maybe one who could be, who could live up to uh, the title as God's son is not uh, a totally lost hope. Um, and so you uh, you really do have, as, as some writers have put it, a messianic um uh, scope to the book of Psalms. Uh, in other words, uh, a witness that really revolves largely around the whole idea of Messiahship, what it is to be, if it is to be, and if so, um, who's going to bring it about? And of course, the resounding answer to that is that God and God alone uh, could possibly uh, could possibly bring it about after uh, we messed it up so bad on our end. <clears throat> and so then that was largely last week. This week, then, I wanted us to turn to probably in terms of, of what you are used to and more familiar with in terms of Advent and in terms of Messianic hope and expectations, uh, the prophets. Um, uh, and that's where we're turning this week. And largely what I want to do is well, a little bit like we did, did last week with Psalms. I want this to be, I'm not going to zero in and spend a huge amount of time on any particular text, but I want this to be a little bit, a little bit less like last week, more of a, a broad picture, a survey uh, uh, to get a, to get a, to get a, a, an idea of, as we talked about the Psalms, likewise, to get an idea of the prophets, uh, realizing as we did with the Psalms that there are many voices and, uh, if we zero in on specific verses, there are many perspectives and many impressions you can get depending on where you look. But on the whole, I think what we see with, with the prophets is much like we saw with the Psalms. Um, expectations that were hopeful, that were dashed, uh, but that did not cease to be, that God gave uh, new breath to. Uh, that points forward to a future in God's hands. So a couple of kind of preliminary uh, remarks, I guess I'd say. Uh, three, about three things about uh, the prophets and how we view them, how we read them, how we think about them before we start looking at uh, some specific texts. One of which, and this is, this is so crucial, no matter what we do with the prophets, whether it be regarding Advent or whatever, the prophets were not crystal ball gazers. Um, that is not the Old Testament prophet. Uh, that is that is would be accurate for some prophets throughout ancient and world history, but not for Old Testament ancient Israelite prophets. Um, they 
they were not into divining in, in terms of, of, you know, on this date at this time, you know, the chicken is going to cross the road at this intersection. That's, that's not biblical prophecy. Biblical prophecy is much more realistic and down to earth, quite frankly, which is what I like about the Old Testament as, as, as a whole. It's, it, it's very real and down to earth in real life. Prophecy in the Old Testament is, is one who is inspired by God to take a look around, to survey, if you will, the current landscape, uh, situation, politics, et cetera, et cetera, and give a very frank and forthright description of what the prophet sees and where the prophet sees that leading. I like to describe it, for example, if you are, you know, if someone is sent to, uh, to have a look at a house and uh, they look it over and one of the comments says, well, you know, you notice in this particular room, there's, a, there's obviously a huge water leak. That's kind of the observation. OK, here's here's the situation. The prophecy, if you will, would be to say, now, you know, if something isn't done about that, if that just keeps going as is you know what's going to happen. The house is going to eventually totally rot and fall in. Um, that's kind of what the prophets do. To survey the house that is the kingdom of Israel, the king's, the king's court, the king's leadership, and to make such assessments. You're going in a certain direction. Here are some things that I see happening. And if they continue, if you continue down this road, so to speak, Here's where it's going to lead. Here's going to be the outcome. Um, and again, there's no crystal balls involved in that. Um, one of the examples I like to use is the prophet Amos in terms of how, how prophecy, by and large, I would say, works. Now, before I mention that, we, have, we of course, do have instances, probably the most obvious of which would be Ezekiel, where prophets have what we might call ecstatic visions, profound, mysterious, spooky, even visionary experiences, you know, Ezekiel with chariot wheels, with eyes and flames and all this kind of stuff. That is a part of the pie that is biblical prophecy. But I believe much more of that pie, so to speak, is what we see, for example, with the prophet Amos. He has a number of visions that are centered around what I would call everyday ordinary objects. For example, Amos has his vision of the plumb line. Now, if, um, if you don't know what a plumb line is, it's just a string with a weight on the bottom of it that you can hold the string, let the weight be at the bottom, and it's going to be perfectly, you know, the Earth's gravity is going to pull it perfectly vertical. It's, you, it's a way of making sure you've got a, a building or a post or something perfectly uh, vertical, not tipping, leaning one way or the other. When, when Amos writes of his vision of a plumb line in regards to ancient Israel, I don't imagine Amos going into some spooky trance and seeing the clouds torn open and there's a huge plumb line hanging out of heaven. I instead imagine Amos walking along one day, perhaps with no particular reason to be where he was at that moment, and he looks over one way or the other, and he notice, notices a house or something being built, and the builder is using a plumb line to make sure a wall or something is straight. And here's where the Holy Spirit gets particularly involved. I would describe it as the prophet having an aha moment, a light bulb going off, the spirit speaking and saying to Amos, producing in Amos the connection, you know what? Ancient Israel is like that house or whatever was being built, and God's holding up a plumb line to ancient Israel. And what God is finding is, guess what? The house that is ancient Israel, it ain't straight. It ain't vertical. Uh, and so Israel, get in plumb. Get straight. Uh, likewise, he has one of Amos's visions is of that of a basket of summer fruit. Uh, 
which he notices is beginning to spoil. And likewise, what I imagine is that Amos is somewhere out and about one day at a market, maybe, who knows, and he sees a basket of fruit. And he notices, wait a minute, I'm not sure I'd want to buy that. It's got some rotten fruit in there. And again, the spirit intercedes, aha moment. You know what? That basket of fruit is like ancient, is like, is like, is like us, is like Israel. A bad, a rotten piece or two can ruin the whole. So with a king, with a Messiah, with an anointed one that is not doing justice and righteousness and walking humbly with God as God's son, unfortunately can rot and ruin the whole basket. Um, I think we'll I think we will get a lot more from the prophets and not feel quite so distant and put off from them if we imagine their prophetic work uh, more in that way than we do with Ezekiel, for instance. Um, so that's that's very significant. Number one. Number two, uh, the prophets are much like the book of Psalms. They are they're not they're not writing in a vacuum. They're not off in some ivory tower somewhere musing and writing down great thoughts that come to them. They're out there in the midst of their people, uh, in the thick of their God working in the midst of those people. And they are reacting, they're responding to what they see around them, to their history. And so likewise, as we pan the prophets, and we by no stretch will be able to hit them all, but, it, but we, could, we could kind of line up the prophets and tag along the way the historical context that each is responding in, to and writing about. Um, and finally... Whether it be something as simple as a plumb line or a basket of summer fruit, it is key to remember that the prophets are not lone rangers. They very much are, are, are spirit inspired. Uh, they are in, 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 in ways a little bit like we have well, I've tried to cast the idea of a Messiah as a king having co-dominion or sharing dominion with God. The prophets, in the light, in like manner, I see as sharing, sharing the bearing of the word with God in in a partnership kind of a way, um, and they're more than just mouthpieces. This, I mean, read Jeremiah, and you'll find uh, that they are not insulated from the circumstances they speak to. Uh, Jeremiah, bless his heart, he just, I mean, he caught it. He caught it tough. Uh, the things that he said uh, got him just in all kinds of trouble and suffered all kinds of grief. Um, you cannot you cannot speak the word of God. You cannot bear the word of God without that affecting you, without that reshaping the very reality in which you live and exist. And I like to illustrate that with a phrase that not every, but many of the prophets prophetic books begin with and that you see in the midst of some of the prophetic books. And almost always the English translates this as when the word of the Lord comes to a prophet. You know, I would say that when Amos realizes this plumb line is all about whether Israel is plumb or not, the word of the Lord came to him in that instant and, and, and gave him that inspiration. What's, what's significant though is that the Hebrew behind that phrase, the word of the Lord coming to a prophet, the actual Hebrew there is that the word of the Lord happens to a prophet. And, I, and that's very significant because there's a perfectly good verb in Hebrew, which means to come. That's not what's used. It's a different, totally different word that means to happen. And that indeed is, I think, in line with what we believe about the work of the Holy Spirit, that when we, uh, when the Holy Spirit comes, when that fire burns, something indeed happens. Uh, it's not just, it's not just, it's not benign in nature. Uh, when we do a baptism, there we see the word of the Lord happening. Something new is created. When we celebrate uh, the sacrament of Holy Communion, that's the word of the Lord happening. 
uh, sins forgiven. We are strengthened. We are reconciled. We are made new. Um, and that really is a theme, I think, that we can 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 talk about in terms of the prophets. Things being made new. Uh, people, places, promises, covenants. In fact, um, Isaiah himself, the prophet Isaiah, one of my favorite verses uh, in Isaiah, maybe in the whole Bible, is in chapter 43, verse 19, when he says, I am about to do, when he's speaking for God and saying, I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Um, that's the kind of God that this is, the God that does does new things. It thinks outside the, outside of the box. That surprises us. Uh, if there's anything we can say about the coming of Jesus as the long-expected Messiah, it's God doing a new thing and the word of the Lord happening in, with, and under uh, that new thing. So in terms of the prophets responding to their history, uh, to their circumstances, the focus of their attention typically is the leadership, i.e. the king, the one who is anointed, king, messiah, who is supposed to be behaving in such a way that you might just mistake him for God's son. But because that's not the case, that's what gives rise to the prophets speaking. You don't really find prophets uh, praising kings. Because if the kings were doing things right, the prophets would have really nothing to write about. Uh, we wouldn't have all of this prophetic literature if Messiahship had not gone so badly wrong uh, in, the, in, in, in ancient Israel. And believe you me, as you well know, I'm sure there are, in most any prophetic book, there is plenty of material uh, to to cite and to remember that identifies just how um, how angry the prophets can be with the leadership for not upholding justice and righteousness, and how profound the judgment proclaimed against kings and the Israel of the the, the, the nation of Israel can be because of that. Um, and I'll go back to Amos for an example of that. Uh, you know, it's Amos uh, that we get the memorable phrase uh, or metaphor or image, however you want to look at that. Um, uh, cows of Bashan, right? When Amos talks about the leaders living it up, um, not uh, not looking after those who are less fortunate, who are needy, but instead reclining on on beds of ivory and and not even sipping wine, but just guzzling it by bowls. Uh, these are the ones that that Amos refers to as as cows cows of Bashan, just just uh, offensive in their um, in their extravagance. In much the same way, we just we looked at Solomon in week one with all of his chariots and horses and his throne of ivory that was overlaid uh, in, in gold. Uh, time and time again, Amos hammers uh, the people of Israel and particularly the leadership of ancient Israel for that kind of behavior. Uh, my, my teacher in seminary, Monty Luker, once told me that, uh, well, he told the class, actually, that... Um, Every time he had been asked to come to a church and do a Bible study on Amos, that after the first first session, about half the people didn't come back because Amos is just that blunt and and and, and uncomfortable. And I'll give you one example of that. Uh, in chapter nine, as we're nearing the end of the book of Amos, uh, chapter nine probably gives us one of the most biting uh, pronouncements that Amos gives uh, in judgment against corrupt kings and leadership. Uh, this is chapter nine. Amos writes, I saw the Lord standing beside the altar and he said, strike the capitals until the threshold shake, shatter them on the heads of all the people. Those who are left, I will kill with the sword. Not one of them shall flee away. Not one of them shall escape. Though they dig into Sheol, from there my hand shall take them. Though they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. 
Though they hide themselves on top of Carmel, from there I will search out and take them. And though they hide from my sight at the bottom of the sea, there I will command the sea serpent, and it shall bite them. And though they go into captivity in front of their enemies, there I will command the sword, and it shall kill them. And I will fix my eyes on them for harm, not for good. The Lord God of hosts, he who touches the earth and it melts and all who live in it mourn and all of it rises like the Nile and sinks again like the Nile of Egypt, who builds his upper chambers in the heavens and founds his vault upon the earth, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out upon the surface of the, of the earth. The Lord is his name. Well. Again, as I have said a few times, so much for the Davidic dynasty. Uh, now, in terms of God's promises to David in that dynasty, remember in 2 Samuel 7, God did clearly say, as we've said before, David, your descendants, get out of line, fail to conduct yourself according to the Torah, as Psalm 1 suggests, as Psalm 72 so eloquently lays out. I will punish you. It's right there. God says, David, your descendants, I will punish you if you don't uh, do this the way I'm laying it out for you. And there it is in Amos, about as bl blatant and blunt and uh, uh, unnerving even as it could get. Go to the bottom of the sea, go to heaven. Dig down to Sheol beneath the earth. You can't hide. God says, I'm going to get you and drag you out and, and kill you. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty profound. And you can find that kind of punishing, judging language in most any of the prophets. Um, and that's because, again, they are writing to bring to the fore the misdirection, the misbehavior, of the leadership of the ancient Israelites and are giving voice to what God said God would do when that happened, that God would punish. Um, but that's not all we find in the prophets because otherwise there would have been no future. There would have been no vision for Messiahship. Um, if that were all the prophets had to say, these words of profound divine judgment, then the book of Psalms should have ended with number 89. Remember with that ending that just says basically, God, what, what, about, the, what about the promises? What about the dynasty? It seems to be overdone. Well, we saw with the book of Psalms, it wasn't, at least not as far as God was concerned. And we see the same thing among the prophets. And that's really what I want to lift up to you um, tonight. Uh, not to overlook, not to just brush under the rug um, the words of judgment that we find in the prophets. Uh, remember when I was talking about that, 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 uh, that telltale self-description of God in Exodus 34, that God is merciful, gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love? That I pointed out that God says, okay, I'm slow to anger, but I'm not immune from anger. Anger is not absent to me. I'm just kind of slow getting there, uh, but I can get there and I will, uh, which is echoed in 2 Samuel 7. David, I will punish you and your descendants if you fall out of line. And in the prophets, we see that happening. But in the prophets, as in the Psalms, we also see God being faithful to promises, faithful to covenant, faithful to steadfast love in being committed to making this Messiah thing work, being committed to not, to not, essentially to not being a dictator, to saying, you troublesome, stiff-necked, rambunctious people are going to be my partners here one way or the other. Um, and we even find that uh, in the book of Amos. In fact, right after uh, those unnerving words that we just heard in chapter 9 because the book ends this way 
And this is right after, by the way, in verse nine, he's continued and he's saying that God says that God will shake the house of Israel among all nations as one shakes with a seed. Um, and that all the sinners of my people shall die by the sword who say evil shall not overtake us. Well, wait and see. But then verse 11, the prophet continues on that day. And whenever you get a phrase like in that day, on that day in the prophets, you should think, oh, here comes one of those new things God said God is capable of and likes to do. On that day, this is chapter 9, verse 11 in Amos. I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen. I'll repair its breaches. I'll raise up its ruins. I'll rebuild it as in the days of old in order that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all nations who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this. The time is surely coming, says the Lord, when the one who plows shall overtake the one who reaps and the treader of grapes, the one who sows the seeds. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them upon their land and they shall never again be plucked up out of the land I've given them says the Lord your God. <clears throat> so after all that very justifiable and appropriate ranting and raving, uh, Amos ends that way. Uh, and, and I would say that is by and large the, uh, uh, the blueprint that we have for much of the, the prophets of, of ancient Israel, particularly, particularly the ones uh, that are from the uh, 700s, 600s, 500s, the, the period when the monarchy is really is really crumbling and it's really looking like time after time after time again. If anything, we're getting worse here, not better. Uh, and when it looks like the car is going over the cliff and when it hits bottom, that's going to be it. Uh, but yet the prophets can speak profound words of judgment and at the same time, uh, offer up words of a future and a vision of hope um, in a steadfast and faithful and loving God. Uh, those two go hand in hand. They're not opposites. It's not one or the other. Um, <clears throat> the most quoted prophet when it comes to messianic hopes, expectations, and certainly in our in our Advent readings, if you look at the Revised Common Lectionary over our three years, years A, B, and C, um, you'll find that, that probably three-fourths of our Sunday readings for Advent come from Isaiah. Uh, in fact, Isaiah is the second, second only to the book of Psalms, Isaiah is the second most quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament. Uh, very significant for the New Testament, Psalms and Isaiah. Um, so I want to look at a few, um, a few texts with you, again, just more on a quick overview survey to illustrate this, this theme that we're seeing again and again of messianic expectation, failure, but reassurance by God and a vision for messianism into the future uh, by God. Um, we need to get no further than Isaiah 2, Isaiah chapter 2, one of our, one of our Advent readings. Uh, the word of Isaiah, the son of Amos, that he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, and there's that phrase, right? God's going to, here, here comes that new God, you're about to do a new thing again. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion, that's Jerusalem, shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. 
Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Now, this is from what we call First Isaiah. Uh, there are a number of hands, if you will, in the book of Isaiah. At least four, most, most likely. There's still debate about this. But the consensus still seems to be that we have three major sections and a, a smaller fourth one within this larger, huge book of Isaiah. Chapters 1 through 39 we call First Isaiah. 8th century Isaiah, Isaiah before Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians and was destroyed. As we get towards the end of 1st Isaiah, though, we, get, we actually get into that territory uh, of that fall, of the destruction of the temple, and then we transition at chapter 40, chapter 40 through 55, we call 2nd Isaiah, which seems to be written by a prophet that is actually in exile. The destruction has happened in 586, 587. Many of the inhabitants of Jerusalem have been forcibly taken to Babylon, and it's written from that perspective, from the exile, from Babylon, thinking back to the destruction, looking back longingly to Jerusalem and the temple. And then third Isaiah, um, chapters 56 through 66, seem to be written from the historical perspective of actually after the exile, after Cyrus of Persia has overtaken the Babylonians and has told the Israelites and any other captors in the Babylonian, what was the Babylonian Empire, you're free to go back, to go back to where you were taken from and to rebuild and to worship there as you wish, largely, as long as you pay me taxes. There's that little detail, but no big surprise there. That's third Isaiah. Now, within that, round about chapter 25, that's what we call the Isaiah Apocalypse, uh, which also seems to be from another hand, uh, probably even later than third Isaiah, uh, uh, that speaks of, that's the text that we use at funerals oftentimes, that this, on this mountain, the Lord will uh, destroy all things that cause God's people grief, even the, uh, the veil that is cast over them, death itself. Um, is, is that text. But what I just read to you from, of course, is from 1st Isaiah. So this chapter 2 text is written from a time when Isaiah the prophet certainly sees um, misdirection, misguidance, uh, things not going well uh, within, within Israel, that the kings are not living up to their expectations. Uh, but yet, notice how hopeful that text was, um, how Isaiah could look at Jerusalem and see a place where the nations would come to for instruction. Um, that's what Israel was always supposed to be, right? A light to the nations, which I think we see largely symbolized and embodied, really, even in the star uh, over Bethlehem. I think you should remember uh, remember this text and a few others when you think about the star and Israel being a light to the nations and people streaming to, uh, if not Bethlehem, Jerusalem or to Israel uh, for instruction. Um, a very hopeful text. Um, of course, now Isaiah has plenty of words to say that are judgmental as well. Just a few chapters after this is Isaiah 5, the song of the vineyard. Remember? where God describes Israel as a vineyard for which God had high hopes. That was a huge letdown. Right? It's a beautiful text, Isaiah 5, uh, about the first seven or eight verses. God describes through the prophet Israel as a vineyard that God had carefully prepared, removed the stones, built the terraces, put a wall, a fence around it to protect it, put watch towers, watch posts so it could be protected. Everything was, if there was a vineyard in the world that would produce the finest grapes and the choicest wine from that, it would be here. But instead, it flopped. The grapes that it produced were just trash, bitter. It was a total disaster. 
Um, and it's a metaphor that Isaiah uses to describe Israel. And I think more, more specifically, messianism, messiahship, um, partnership with God as, as a king, as a son of God. Uh, it's in the midst of these texts, but at the same time, the prophet gives us hope beyond that. Okay, that's that's what I want you to see. The, the continuing tension between these two. Uh, God's not going to just wave some magic wand and make it all better. No, this it's going to be a process, and it's going to be there's going to be some pain involved in it. But as the Psalms testified, God's faithful and steadfast love is what will what will be the predominant feature and what will reign and win out in all of it. Uh, a few more Isaiah texts here. Uh, can't, can't miss Isaiah chapter 7. This is verses 10 through 16 thereabouts. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord, your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. Now, the last line there is a, 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 a hint at the historical background here. Ahaz, King Ahaz at this point, is in a tizzy. He doesn't know what to do. Um, he is being pressured by the king of the northern, the northern kingdom and a foreign nation to enter into a military alliance against another foreign nation. And he's going, do I do this? Do I throw in with them? Or what if we lose? Da, 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 da. He's, I can say he's in a pickle. He's in a tizzy. Uh, what do I do? Do I enter into this military alliance to challenge uh, our enemy? Or do I say, nope, I'm, I, we're Jerusalem. We're having no part of this. And Isaiah speaks to him and says, look, Ahaz, chill, calm down. Ask a sign of God. Talk to God about this. How, there's a zany idea. Um, ask for a sign. High as heaven, deep as Sheol. <laughs> and what a time for a king of Israel to get all self-righteous. Oh, no, I won't ask for a sign. That, that might be, that might not be a good, that might be out of line for me to do such a thing. Well, please. To which the, the prophet says, okay, fine. God says, you won't ask, I'll give you one anyway. And here it is. And this is the way it is sometimes with God's signs. Again, they're not, they're, they, they tend not to be what I would call Hollywood special effects uh, level uh, things like we might imagine. Remember at the burning bush when Moses is wanting a sign that this whole cockamamie idea of him going to Egypt and freeing the, the Hebrews from Pharaoh is going to work. Remember the sign that God gave? Well, Moses, I tell you what. When you and all the people get back here and you worship me on this mountain, then you'll know. There's your sign. When it all works out and, I, and you come back here and I say, see, told you so, there'll be your sign. Now go. Um, so what is the sign here to, I, to Ahaz that Isaiah proclaims? Well, look over there, Ahaz. You see that young woman? You see, she's with child and she's going to bear a son. Why don't you name that child Emmanuel, which means God is with us. It's an actual Hebrew phrase, im anu el, with us is God. Um, and we don't know, even know who this child was. Maybe it was, maybe it was a child. It, it, in fact, if we read further in the text, we see it may in fact have been one who would be born to be Ahaz's own son. It may have been Ahaz's wife who was pregnant. It, that seems probably to have been the case. But in any, in any case, Isaiah is saying as a son, as a reminder to you that God is with you, that you are not alone in this, name that child when it is born, which itself is a statement of hope and faith. 
when that child is born, name that child Emmanuel. God is with us. And let that be a sign to you. And by the way, that child is going to be born. You're going to name him Emmanuel. And before that child even knows how to refuse evil and good and know the difference, the two kings you're so worried about, they'll be a distant memory. That's basically how verse 16 wraps up that particular uh, short text there. <clears throat> There's your sign, a name, a child, uh, and a promise. Isaiah 9, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. The yoke of their burden, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. And this is crucial. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Not us. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Um, this is probably the same child we were talking about in chapter 7, which has now actually been born uh, probably Ahaz's son, quite possibly the one who would become King Hezekiah, who turned out to be one of the best that Israel had out of the whole bunch, and one in whom there may have been extremely high hopes. Finally, maybe this will be the one that'll get it right. He didn't quite his history and everything did not line up for the circumstances to work out for him to be the one, which gives rise and opening for this text to even look beyond the time of Ahaz and even perhaps Hezekiah, uh, to look even further forward down the line uh, that perhaps, okay, the wait's not quite over yet after all. But it doesn't mean that we're done for. It doesn't mean that it's it's over. We're not ending at the end of Psalm 89 here. And we see that as we inch a little bit for, further forward in Isaiah, Isaiah 11. Very familiar text in the, the image that it gives us of a shoot coming out of the stump of Jesse. A branch shall grow out of its roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, which, by the way, are the literally messianic attributes that we speak over someone, oftentimes, of course, an infant who is being baptized. And in doing so, we, we echo Isaiah in saying it's the zeal of the Lord of hosts that does this, that says, God, in this sacrament, it is you who are placing upon this person, even this infant, spirit of spirits of wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge and fear of the Lord which is the exact same thing that Psalm 2, Psalm 72, et cetera, lift up for God's anointed, God's Messiah, God's own son. Uh, that's one of the crazy graceful things about baptism is that we all get to, to wear the term Messiah when that cross is forever made upon our forehead. Look no further than Isaiah and the messianic hopes and struggles of the Old Testament in this time period for the the, the, the theological meat and roots of where that where that comes from. Um, 
The passage continues, the wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf, the lion, the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, the nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, the weaned child shall put its hand in the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters that cover the sea. Uh, extremely, extremely hopeful statement uh, that maybe it's already been realized here that the one who was hoped for, this, this child of Ahaz, maybe ain't going to cut the mustard just yet, even, even in himself. But nonetheless, we're not giving up. Henceforth comes this image of a shoot from the stump of Jesse. And I got to tell you, this is about as, as, as real and true to Israel an image as you can get. I can't tell you how many times I've seen in Israel a uh, stump of an olive tree. Those things are hard to kill. You can cut them down and hack them and burn them and try to dig them and plow them up. And you think, oh, that's done for. That thing's dead. And next thing you know, you look down at the bottom there and there's all these little green shoots. And what do you know? The sucker's alive and it's going to grow and produce fruit after all. Uh, that's the image that I think Isaiah is pulling upon here, that, that olive tree that uh, is so resilient and just will not say I'm done for, uh, that puts out a shoot and, um, and has a hope that uh, goes beyond a situation of what would appear to be hopelessness and ending in death. Um, I'll also go ahead and mention um, uh, this word a shoot or a branch is, is significant in terms of the one that we know would turn out to be finally this hoped for Messiah. Um, uh, Netzer in Hebrew is, is branch. Uh, guess what? There's a place in Israel called Netzeret. In English, that's Nazareth. Well, where did Jesus grow up, by the way? Nazareth. So the branch, the one who would turn out to be the branch, actually grew up in a place called, literally, Branch Town. That's no accident. Okay. Um, We will let's let's end with this one and we'll continue with the prophets and, and wrap up with some of the New Testament material I referenced last week when we gather next week. Um, Isaiah 35. Uh, this is one of our our Advent A lessons, which we actually had just last week, if memory serves me. Uh, the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly. And rejoice with joy and singing. Um, you know, and again, very true to Israel. Wilderness, yeah, it's pretty dry land uh, for at least nine, ten months out of the year, particularly. The idea that it can rejoice, blossom like the crocus, blossom abundantly, rejoice with joy and singing. Again, it's an image that people could latch on to because even though that wilderness is it's just so barren and looks so dead, at least nine or so months out of the year, when the winter and spring rain, early spring rains come, and it's not much in the wilderness, what we call the wilderness, I mean, three or four inches is a good year of rain, but it's enough. It's enough that, believe it or not, that barren landscape can just burst into life. So it's a little bit like the stump metaphor here. Isaiah is sharing an image that people could, could just totally picture and, 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 and know so well. I really believe largely to say, oh, Israel, our Messiah right now looks like the wilderness in those nine months, our messianic hopes. But know this, like a shoot that'll come forth from a stump, like the wilderness that can even itself bloom and blossom 
and blossom abundantly and to the point that it looks like it's rejoicing. Um, that's going to be our messianic hopes as well. If we uh, it just, 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 just let's just hang in there. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands, make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful of heart, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. Remember, Emmanuel, God's with us. He will, oh, wait a minute. Uh-oh, is this the wrong lesson? He will come with vengeance and with terrible recompense. Whoa, where'd that come from? Well, remember, slow to anger, not lacking in thereof, part of rebirth, part of being made new, like a refiner's fire, for example, uh, can include a bit of pain. However, in the last portion of verse 4, he will come and save you. Those two are in the same verse. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Uh, purifying you to save you from yourself, I would, I would say. He will come, uh, he will, uh, the, the, verse five, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. The lame shall leap like a deer, the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. Waters shall break forth in the wilderness, streams in the desert. Now you can find some waters, some springs in the desert, but you've got to look far and far and wide. We're talking about just springs bursting forth everywhere here. Um, the burning sand shall become like a pool, thirsty ground, springs of water. The haunt of jackals become like a swamp and the grass become reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there, and it'll be called a holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. <laughs> I think this is, I, I think there's very clear intended humor here from Isaiah. No traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. Uh, I mean, just a total bungling idiot. No, even 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 you can can find your way on this road. Um, no lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. The ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads, and they shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. So it sounds like here, first Isaiah is, is witnessing to at least the beginnings of the fall of Jerusalem, of its destruction. Uh, but even in the midst of that, being able to look beyond it, uh, to look at a stump, to look at a barren wilderness and say, it ain't over yet. This ain't the way this story ends. Um, the book of Psalms, again, does not end at Psalm 89 and the ending thereof. Um, so we'll, we'll button it up there with that, uh, with that very hopeful note from Isaiah. And uh, we will continue with some more prophetic material next week in terms of, of a surprising, really, uh, counterintuitive hopefulness in the face of the historical circumstances uh, and see how that leads us right into the, uh, what we're preparing ourselves for the birth of, of the Messiah in the New Testament. So blessings to you, and I look forward to seeing you again uh, next Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.